Fungi, especially filamentous fungi, molds, and mushrooms, possess an incredible ability to produce valuable products for mankind. Any guesses what this ice cream, steak, and protein powder have in common? If you guess that they're all made from genetically engineered fungi, you're right. There's currently an explosion of investment in R&D into what is collectively being called food tech. $13.5 billion globally in just the first quarter of 2021 alone. And while the food industry is quickly capitalizing on fungi's incredible capacity to produce valuable products, it's early yet and there's still a wide open world of discovery to be had in and outside of food. In a previous video, I reviewed DNA plasmid basics, that they're basically the code you write in DNA to program fungi and other organisms. In this video, I'll show you how I revived some DNA sent to me through the mail and used it to genetically engineer Escherichia coli, better known as E. coli, for less than a few dollars. What does E. coli have to do with fungi engineering, you might ask? E. coli is an incredibly important tool used in something called molecular cloning. Not to mention, E. coli itself is widely used to ferment all kinds of products in food, healthcare, and chemistry. If you want to learn mushroom engineering, starting with E. coli is a great stepping stone. So let's dive into it. What do companies like High Country Fungi, Mossy Creek Mushrooms, and Mycosymbiotics have in common? What is the business these fine fungipreneurs are in? Some would say the mushroom growing business. Others might argue they're in the alternative protein business. I'd argue that they are much, much more than that. They're innovators. Their combined efforts to innovate in the areas of mushroom hunting, breeding, and cultivation are major contributors to the booming popularity of fungi-based products across America's historically mycophobic populace. Not to mention that, like myself, Many of these folks are drawn to the mushroom growing world through an experience or fascination with the psychedelic mushroom Psilocybe cubensis. Left to allow their interest in mushrooms blossom, coupled with their hard work and perseverance, they've managed to breed some of the most delicious, healthy, and sustainable foods around. And even better, they've created growing businesses around this tight-knit community. But in the same way that online communities like Shroomery have been encouraging motivated self-taught micropreneurs to experiment and contribute to the growing body of knowledge around mushroom cultivation, I think we're at the beginning of the next big iteration in the mushroom-based business. In the next five years, I'd like to see more fungi startups like these trading plasmids, isolating and capturing novel strains of molds and harnessing their ability to ferment proteins, medicines, packaging, and more. Imagine if these innovators worked together to design and grow super strains of mushrooms that offered incredible medicinal potency, longer shelf life, new flavor profiles, and whatever else you can imagine. Well, it can, and it will. But to start engineering fungi, we need to first take a look at engineering E. coli and its use in molecular cloning. Let's say you've got a mushroom and you want to figure out how to make a bioluminescent mushroom from a mushroom that doesn't naturally luminesce. And you've gone through the hard work of figuring out all the biosynthetic pathways and the genes involved, and you've assembled a plasmid containing all the genes of interest necessary to make a mushroom that doesn't luminesce, luminesce. Once you've designed the DNA, you can send that DNA off to a third-party company like GeneWiz and have it synthesized and sent to you, but they're only gonna send you a fixed amount. How do you make sure that you have enough so that as your experimentation grows and evolves, you don't run out of this really expensive synthesized DNA? Or maybe in another option is you clone the genes from existing mushrooms using a, a similar technology that I talked about in my DNA barcoding at home videos, and you take all of these genes and you ligate them together, you assemble them into a plasmid. How would you test that plasmid? How would you create copies of it? Well, that's where learning E. coli transformation can come into play. E. coli is considered a model organism. That is, understanding how E. coli works at a very fine detail allows us to actually extrapolate and better understand how all other organisms work. It's been very well studied and documented, and we have a large body of knowledge around E. coli, E. coli transformation, and especially protein synthesis and production by E. coli itself. By learning E. coli transformation, we actually can take a more simplistic approach to understanding the general steps involved in genetic transformation of organisms, and that's going to help us build a foundation for doing more complex transformations coming in the future, like with agrobacteria and then finally with fungi itself. By transforming E. coli, we can not only test our own DNA plasmids, we can use it to copy DNA so that we don't have to hire a company to synthesize it every time. We can actually just 
transform the E. coli with our plasmid, grow a bunch of it, filter it out, and have all the supply we might ever need. The other great thing about learning E. coli is it's a great platform for testing protein expression. A big part of what we're doing when we're de designing DNA is we're putting together genes that actually allow the organism to produce new proteins or enzymes that they otherwise wouldn't have produced. E. coli, given that it's so easy to work with and it grows so quickly, allows us to test the protein production capabilities and scale them to a large enough production capacity to meet any potential customer demand. And although learning fungi engineering and transformation may be a little bit more complex and have a few steps involved, the general framework for doing transformation of organisms is pretty similar. We're going to design DNA, we're going to prepare cells for the DNA to go into the cells, we'll actually perform the transformation, and then we'll do a selection step, which is, allows us to select which cells have actually taken up our DNA and are expressing the genes that we want it to express. Briefly, let's talk a little bit about the different kinds of strains there are of E. coli. For this video and in my experimentation, I'm using a pretty common strain called DH5-alpha. It is a non-pathogenic strain of E. coli. That is, it won't cause any kind of diseases by working with it. Now there's lots of different strains of E. coli you can use and each strain of E. coli has been genetically modified to have certain advantages over other strains. Things like using a strain that is designed to create lots of copies of the plasmid you put into it versus strains that are optimized for protein production, for example. For the sake of this video, I'm using DH5-alpha, which is a pretty common staple bacteria to use for doing cloning, as we mentioned before, assembling your DNA, and then also growing enough out that you can filter it out and have plasmid to work with. But that doesn't mean you can't use other strains. You absolutely can, and you should dig into this a little bit more. But for the sake of beginning, and if you don't know where to begin, use DH5-alpha. It's used a ton in papers, and that's how I found out about it. And it's used in the main paper that I'm using to replicate fungal genetic engineering experiment. So let's jump to the lab, and I'm gonna walk you through how to do your first genetic transformation of E. coli. Some months ago, I reached out to a professor in Spain and asked if he would send me the plasma that he had used in a published paper, and he did. He sent me a letter and he sent me plasma that it was uh, sent, put on a small piece of filter paper that you'll be able to see here. And you can kind of see the DNA that's been dotted onto this little piece of paper. And if you put this piece of filter paper into a tube with about 50 microliters of sterile water, you can dilute the or elute the plasmid out of the paper and use it in a, in a transformation like the one that I'm going to show you today. So the only reagent you need to do for this type of E. coli transformation, which is called heat shock, is calcium chloride. Of course, you'll also need to prepare an antibiotic stock as well that we'll use for selection. And this particular plasmid has a canamycin resistance gene, so we need to prepare um, some canamycin. We'll prepare a 1000x canamycin concentrate. And we'll do that by weighing out 0 0.05 grams of canamycin and mixing that with one milliliter of sterile H2O. And what I'm showing here is just uh, how we filter sterilize the canamycin stock by pre-wetting the filter and then adding the weighed canamycin to the sterile syringe and plunging it into a 1.5 milliliter centrifuge tube. Once we've added the 1000X stock to the tube, we'll label it. And then it is light and temperature sensitive. So what we'll want to do is I like to take these 50 milliliter conical tubes, cover them with tin foil, drop the aliquot into it, and then put that in the freezer for when we need it. The next thing we're going to need to do is revive one of our uh, plates containing DH5-alpha and use that to create a seed starter culture the night before. 
The next morning, you'll want to go ahead and prepare the samples that will actually be transformed by labeling two tubes or one, however many you want to have, adding some fresh LB broth to them, and then using some of the seed culture you created from the night before and adding 100 microliters of that culture into the tubes. Once we've added the seed culture into these tubes, it's time to pop them into the incubator and let them grow out for about four hours. You'll know they're ready when you pull them out and they're a little bit cloudy. In the meantime, we're gonna go ahead and prepare our plates uh, by adding antibiotic to the plates for selection. And what I'm gonna do, or how I'm gonna do that, is pull out that canamycin stock that's frozen. Um, you'll notice that it was frozen there and I used my hand to warm it up. So we take some pre-poured LB plates, label them, and then I would like to take a, a tube that I use for spreading and I add about uh, about 350 to 400 microliters of sterile water and then I add one microliter of the 1000x canamycin stock per milliliter of media that I use on the plate which is around 35 to 40. Sterilize the area with some isopropyl alcohol including the the plate spreader. Yes, I like to reuse my plate spreader. I found that as long as I sterilize them properly with alcohol, they work just fine. And so we just uh, use a pipette to add the antibiotic solution to the plates and spread them around. And we'll also need to go ahead and start heating our water bed, our water bath to 42 degrees Celsius. And we'll go ahead and prepare the ice bath because there's an important step here where we will need to cool down our cell culture. And so when you add, you don't need a really big plate you just or a bowl. Uh, you just need something small. Add a little bit of water that will help to evenly distribute the coldness. So after the four hours, we're, pouring, we're pulling the culture out. We're pulling out the calcium chloride solution that we created earlier. And we're getting ready to run the procedure. And the first thing that we're going to do is spin down the cultures that have been incubating for the last four hours to pelletize the bacteria. And we'll spin them around at 7,000 RPM for about 10 minutes. You can kind of see the pellet there at the bottom. Pour out the uh, remaining broth and we'll go ahead and add some calcium chloride and the amount that I like to add that I have sort of figured out through a lot of trial and error is 100 microliters of ice cold 100 millimeter calcium chloride and you can just use the pipette to mix it and then we'll put it on ice for about 30 minutes. After the 30 minutes we're going to go ahead and add our Spanish plasma DNA. We're going to add one microliter of the Spanish plasma DNA and I found the method of actually dropping it into the solution is kind of important. And here you'll see that I just take a droplet and I deposit it right on the surface and give it just a couple of flicks to mix it in and then back into the ice it goes for another 30 minutes. Now we're getting ready to actually perform the heat shock and what we're going to do now is after the 30 minute incubation period of the calcium chloride bacteria mix we will just dunk the tube into the 42 degrees Celsius water for 30 seconds and notice that I'm not really doing any vigorous shaking I'm just completely submerging it and then immediately moving it back to ice for about two minutes and finally we move on to the recovery step which involves adding a thousand microliters of fresh LB to the solution and we'll put that in the incubator for about an hour to let the cells recover and now we're ready to take 
our transformed bacteria and plate them for selection. And remember these plates have the canamycin on them. Of course there's also a control. And so we'll plate about 300 to 400 microliters of the transformed bacterial solution to the selection plates containing canamycin. And once we've done that, we can move these plates uh, back into the incubator and leave them overnight. And we'll check them after about 24 hours and see how they do. All right, it's been about 24 hours since I ran the heat shock transformation protocol for the E. coli using the Spanish plasmid. And if you'll remember, the Spanish plasmid has a canamycin resistance gene in it. So if we see any colonies, that's a great sign. Because if you remember, I put canamycin over the top of that media. So nothing should grow except for the bacteria that has the gene for canamycin resistance. And uh, that's known as a selection gene um, because it allows us to select only the bacteria that has our plasmid in it and uh, continue to work with it. So let's take a look inside the incubator and see if we have any plates that are growing that canamycin resistant plasmid. All right, if all goes well, you'll get a nice plate like this one with lots of colonies that have been successfully transformed and are expressing the canamycin resistance gene. From here, what we can do is start a liquid culture uh, and then run what's called a mini prep kit to filter and purify out the Spanish plasmid that we grew in our transformed E. coli so that we can proceed with our fungal transformation experimentation. That's going to be it for this video, E. coli heat shock transformation. I'll see you next time as we make steady progress towards our goal of DIY fungi engineering from a home lab. It's so beautiful, you and me.